Thank you for joining us for Ask a Historian. I'm Matthew Wilkinson, historian with Heritage Mississauga, and each week we invite you to send in your questions and we can explore the fascinating history of the city of Mississauga together. We also invite you to send in some questions about Heritage Mississauga itself. Next week, Heritage Mississauga will be celebrating its 60th anniversary, and on a special edition of Ask a Historian, which will air on Friday, December 11th, we'll explore some of the stories of Heritage Mississauga. Thank you. Thank you, Lawrence, for your question. And uh, the, the neighborhood you're looking at uh, around Woodlawn, that is known as the Credit Grove. And the Credit Grove subdivision began back in 1912. So it's one of the older subdivisions in the city of Mississauga, and that's certainly reflected on a lot of the surviving architecture that's in the community as well. Uh, the subdivision was planned by a company known as the International Permanent Investments Limited out of Toronto, and they published a subdivision plan back in, again, 1912. Uh, and they named it the Credit Grove, and they, part of their, uh, their advertising, if you will, for the Credit Grove was uh, um, what was called Restricted to High Class Residential District, uh, and it highlighted the transportation links back to Union Station and how close Credit Grove was compared to some of the other prominent early subdivisions that were where we're shaping up in and around the Toronto area, and these included uh, St. Andrew's Gardens, uh, West Toronto, Weston, Scarborough, and Centre Island, all which had a longer commuting time than, than uh, Credit Grove did. Uh, and so that was part of the major uh, sales pitch, if you will, from Credit Grove, the, the close proximity to um, uh, the Trans uh, Lakeshore Road, uh, which was prior to the QW, Lakeshore was the highway into Toronto, but also to um, some of the early transportation networks, uh, like the radial railway uh, connecting into Toronto and Union Station. So very much part of that was again, a focus of Credit Grove, again, a high-class residential uh, subdivision um, with its connections to, you know, its, its selling feature, if you will, to those that were working in uh, in Toronto, uh, but looking for a place to live outside outside the city proper itself. Um, the uh, the one of the the uh, subdivision plan itself advertised uh, electricity, sidewalks, good paved roads, um, and uh, and graded streets, uh, and so this is the uh, and water hookup as well. So, but what they didn't do was like we we see today in subdivisions where you you buy the finished house. In this case, you bought an empty lot, uh, and within a covenant time of three years, you had to have your house built and then hooked up to the water and electrical and that sort of thing. And and this is what what kind of shows itself on the landscape today in that it it marketed itself to say uh, uh, upper middle class uh, working population mm -hmm. in Toronto um, who then brought their own ideas for what they wanted to see in their houses with them and so you have a great variety uh, in the houses that were built back between uh, approximately 1912 and 1920 that's kind of the the early building phase of, of, of the Credit Grove um, and so you see a lot of different architecture style you see uh, neoclassical you see bungalow you even see some four what's known as four square architecture, uh, a, 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 a wide array. It's a wonderful look at uh, kind of early architecture. Of course, in the modern city, we see a lot of replacement going on. So you're, you're seeing a lot of uh, infill of new uh, development taking place in Credit Grove as well. But some of those old gems still really do peek through. And uh, um, we also, we know it's built in close proximity to the St. Lawrence Starch Company, uh, which had begun uh, in Port Credit in, uh, in 1889. Uh, and so you do wonder also, was there any connection between the people who lived in Credit Grove and might have worked at St. Lawrence Starch uh, itself? We don't know that for sure, but uh, you certainly have that, you know, in close proximity uh, to that uh, to that community. And at the time of Credit Grove's development, uh, and, and you have to picture kind of what the historic Port Credit looked like, a little less populated than it is today. Uh, Credit Grove in 1912 more than doubled the residential size of Port Credit. It was a major uh, uh, portion of development for, for Port Credit in its history. So Credit Grove is again played a significant role in the evolution of uh, of uh, the village and town of uh, of Port Credit. So again, it was it was uh, 1912 advertised. Uh, lots for sale within this uh, this new subdivision. And most of the roads are named at that point as well. Some of them have been renamed over time, but it, you you have uh, kind of the, the framework of what would become Credit Grove was established back in uh, in 1912. Um, the building styles most commonly present in Credit Grove today represent kind of the first two and th two or three decades of the 20th century. 
predominantly kind of between say 1912 and 1920 also certainly you have some into the 30s and 40s also built within that community um, uh, two things that became very prominent uh, are that the initial residents in the neighborhood belonged to kind of an affluent class, a uh, working class of, uh, of Toronto laborers, uh, management, bank employees and the like, um, really geared to kind of the, the more affluence of, uh, of society at the time. Um, and uh, uh, also because it was a subdivision um, and uh, outside of the city itself, but marketing itself for commuting population, um, we uh, and driveways are included in that original plan of, of, of uh, housing lots that uh, automobiles in the in the 1920s also reflect a level of affluence uh, this was a, a, a community that was expected to kind of be on that cutting edge and leading edge of uh, the new society that's emerging in the age of the automobile um, Credit Grove today offers a broad mix of an early 20th century architecture and take a stroll along the different streets of, of, uh, of the Credit Grove and uh, you know you can you can uh, embrace a lot of different architectural styles uh, in, in a kind of a single walk whether it's uh, down Woodlawn or, uh, or um, uh, 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 Mohawk or Cayuga or Tecumseh or any of those other early streets that are part of, of Credit Grove. Uh, very Forest Avenue, of course, as well, and uh, very much a, a, an integral part of, of, uh, of, of the community of, of those early architectural styles that really anchor uh, Port Credit and the Credit Grove into the history of the city of Mississauga. So, uh, Lawrence, thank you for the question. Credit Grove is a really a special place. Um, a marvel to look at the interplay of, uh, of uh, uh, architectural styles over time. Even the modern architecture that's going in is, is, is quite unique in some cases. Um, but it's a neat interplay between uh, old and new and uh, hopefully we can keep a little bit of the old uh, even as we marvel at some of the new that is coming in. So again, thank you for your question and uh, hope you enjoy the strolls around the Credit Grove. So joining, this, uh, this, uh, joining us this week on Ask a Historian is Henrik Sokolovsky. And I know I didn't say that correctly, but uh, uh, the, the, the pronunciation, uh, I, I'm not trained on the, on the pronunciation there. Uh, but uh, Henrik is the deputy curator at the Museum and Archives of the Polish Armed Forces, uh, also known as the Orlinsky Museum, and also the treasurer of the National Board of Polish Combatants Association in Canada. Um, and uh, Henrik is going to join us uh, and, and uh, explore the origins and story behind uh, the Orlinsky Museum at Vave Villa uh, down in Clarkson. And so I'm just wondering if you can uh, tell me, we had, we had uh, your, um, uh, your co-worker on a couple of weeks ago and, and Rob Stanchik talking about the exhibits that are, are ongoing now, but uh, uh, these days of COVID have presented some interesting challenges to operating museums and, and uh, connecting with our, our normal clientele, if you will. And, uh, but I'm just wondering if you can uh, kind of explore the origins of, of uh, the Orlinsky Museum with me. Sure. Uh, Vavel Villa, the W is pronounced like a V basically, Vavel Villa, uh, was um, the brainchild of a gentleman called George Kowalczyk. Uh, George is an engineer by profession, uh, very passionate uh, to help the veterans uh, back in the 80s and they established Vavel Villa as a senior's residence. It was, the, the saying goes it was built by Polish veterans for Polish veterans. Uh, in today's um, uh, climate, you can't really deny anybody uh, uh, residency there, but it was originally intended for the Polish veterans. So a number of these uh, uh, Polish veterans uh, lived there, including um, Bolesław Orlinski, who was a, a well-known pilot his claim to fame was, was twice. 1931, he actually won a, an air race in uh, Cleveland, beating a German, by the way. The German wasn't very happy. He was a well-known German pilot. Polish uh, airplane, fighter airplanes were actually state-of-the-art in the early 30s. People don't know this. Of course, they got completely buried by the Luftwaffe in the, later in the 30s. But uh, his other claim to fame was that in, uh, I believe it's 26, if I'm not mistaken, he was the first uh, pilot to fly into Japan from the continents. Uh, 
he actually did a journey from Warsaw to Tokyo and back um, in 1926. So the Japanese uh, were absolutely tickled pink by this, and they remembered him for decades, and less so now, but they certainly uh, revered him for many, many years. Uh, by the time World War II came along, he was a little too old to be a fighter pilot, so he was basically training and so on, and commanding. Uh, but um, he wound up at Vavil Villa, and when he died, he left a little bit of money uh, for uh, the villa, and George Kowalczyk, established a museum in his honor. In Polish, uh, you, you can you name things after people. So the, the Polish, the, the museum and archives dedicated to the Polish uh, armed forces in the name of or in honor of Colonel Pilot Bolesław Orlinski is actually the full name. It's a mouthful in English, but it flows much better in Polish, believe me. Uh, the, uh, so that's what George did. He took two rooms. Because he was the C first CEO, actually, of Vavel Villa as well, he took a couple of rooms in the basement and established a museum. Um, I don't even remember what year it was. Robert probably told you. I, ha I have written down here February 24th, 2002. That's it, 2002. That's how it rings a bell, yeah. So that, a full 10 years after Orlinsky died, actually. Okay. So George took the initial donations and made them into a museum. Uh, and I can tell you that we've had all kinds of visitors to that museum um, from Poland as well. I've sent you some photos yes. of more recent. Um, there was one photo I sent you of... Um, Anna Maria Anders visiting. She's a, she was at the time Polish senator, uh, even though she wasn't living in Poland. Um, she is actually the daughter, uh, one of the daughters of uh, General uh, Anders, who was the commander of the Polish Second Corps in Italy. So the connection uh, between Anna Maria Anders and our World War II veterans, especially the ones who fought in Italy, which is most of them, it was quite deep. And so the photo that I sent you where she's meeting Jan Gregalis, the man is blind. He was uh, uh, blinded during, um, during the battle. But um, these people that, you know, you can just feel the emotion uh, when these people connect. Jan unfortunately recently died. Uh, but yeah, so uh, George took this seed and he helped it grow. And basically, uh, Whereas the Polish Combatants Association that I began with is mostly Polish Second Corps. These are the people who were deported to Siberia. Those who were able to get out in 1941-42 uh, into the Middle East. And then they wound up through the Middle East and into Italy and wound up fighting in the Italian campaign. But Pavel Villa also had pilots stationed in England. You had Polish first armored divisions. These followed uh, D-Day into Northern Europe and um, uh, helped to liberate uh, France, Belgium, and Holland. They wound up um, accepting the uh, surrender of the German naval forces at Wilhelmshaven at the end of the war. Um, and then you had a, a significant Polish Navy that was involved. One of our um, nicest uniforms is actually of Admiral Tominski, who uh, also lived at Vavel Villa. And I sent you a photo of him meeting some students just before he died. He died at the age of 98, but the photo I sent you, he was meeting students. There's an elementary school next door to Vavel Villa. And we used to take some veterans over there, not just veterans, but the, the civilian survivors of the war and have them meet the uh, students for a Remembrance Day. And uh, Tominski, he's famous for rescuing the remnants of the Royal Regiment of Canada during the debacle at Dieppe. Uh, he was the captain of a uh, uh, destroyer. 
he was told not to approach the beach because of the danger. I mean, it was a hell of a battle. But he knew that these men were trying to get off the beach. And he rescued approximately 85 members of the Royal Regiment of Canada. If he had not done that, the Royal Regiment would have ceased to exist. But he took those 85 men back to England and they formed the, the uh, core of the rebirth of the Royal Regiment. Um, so we had uh, some very, very well-known, important people uh, living at, at uh, Vauville Villa, indeed in Canada in general. And, you know, even if they're not famous, they all had a role to play in the war. They all survived one way or another. Uh, the stories are endless as to what they, these people went through. And a lot of them were actually also Polish Home Army, uh, Armia Krajowa. And this was the main un underground uh, movement in Poland. And, you know, I grew up in Canada learning about the French Résistance, but the Résistance was peanuts compared to what was happening in Poland. I've read about that, yes. Yeah, you know, um, the problem was getting information out and Polish is not a well studied language. So, you know, people uh, know everything about the German archives, they know everything about the Russian archives, but very few people study Polish, <clears throat> historians especially. So, uh, plus the other thing was that the, the stories the Poles told were so fantastic, nobody believed them. So they, they always thought Poles were exaggerating about the Germans, about what they were doing to the Poles, to the Jews, and the, and the Russians, the way they worked. And I had one lady I interviewed who survived to Siberia. And at the end of an interview, I would say, so you have any advice for the younger generation and stuff like this, you know, get a job, you know, this kind of thing, be nice. She said only one thing don't trust the Russians. <clears throat> and it's true. To this day, they're lying. You know, Putin is still uh, denying what happened during World War II, not just to Poles, but to his own people. They just can't deal with the truth, and they've been hiding it for Lord knows how long. But anyway, we've had a lot of interesting people staying at Vavel Villa, We've got some interesting uh, artifacts through these people. Then when Dr. Henrik Radetzky from St. Catharines had to uh, um, empty his collection at the Royal Canadian Legion Hall in St. Catharines, he brought that over maybe 10, 15 years ago, and the collection overnight doubled. And it's still been growing ever since. Um, one of the things you do when you are out of your homeland, especially if your homeland is occupied like it was by um, atheistic peoples, the communists, is you continue to uh, celebrate the traditional holidays and memorials and so on. So in Poland, for example, during the communist era, you couldn't celebrate Polish Soldiers' Day. Now, there's a reason for that. That's because Poland was dominated by, by the Soviets, the Russians. And Polish Soldiers' Day in August um, commemorated the Polish victory over the, the Bolsheviks in 1920. So the, you can imagine the Russians were a little sore about uh, celebrating that. So what? this is what they would do. They would have Polish Soldiers' Day at Vauville Villa, indeed in Polonia all across the world. Um, and they made a point of it because it was banned in Poland. And Poles who came after, who, who lived through communism and came, they were so happy to see that these traditions were being kept alive outside of the country that they could rejoin them. And again, that was very emotional for these people. So th that's what the, the museum was responsible for as well. Not just the artifacts, but also the, the memory and, and the, the traditions, the guardians. I, I have more questions about the museum, but one just popped yeah. up now. Um, it, you have some significant uh, 
uh, individuals who were connected to the warriors in Poland in the Second yeah. World War who lived at Wawe Villa, and then obviously lots of others of Polish descent at uh, yeah. Wawe Villa as well. What brought them to Canada? Like like uh, Tominski and and uh, like, do, do you have an idea of how they ended up here? In the journey? Very simple answer. You could not go back to Poland if you had fought for Poland in the West. There were a case, the, the communists considered anybody who fought for the West to be a capitalist pig. And not only that, they considered them to be traitors because the Russians, uh, the Soviets, and the Polish communists who, who were their puppets um, only had one version of history. And that they blamed everything on the Germans and the Soviets did nothing bad. And of course, this was far from the truth, because we know now that Stalin was actually probably a greater butcher than, than Hitler ever was, and over a longer period of time as well. So they could not go back. There were cases of Poles from the Polish Second Corps, for example, who went back to Poland after the war, because they did try to entice them back. But they were oppressed. They were given the worst jobs. Some of them were sent to jail. Some of them were shot. I know of at least one gentleman in my father's regiment who went back and was shot. So they could not go back to live under this oppressive, Soviet-dominated, uh, atheistic regime. They couldn't. So they went all over, over the world. Most of them were in, in England because that was their first um, uh, uh, landing space outside of uh, the continent. And then from England, they are actually, they, the British didn't want them either. So they were given one-way tickets to wherever they wanted to go. And mostly Commonwealth. So we're talking Canada, uh, Australia has a lot, even New Zealand. And a lot went to the United States anyway. Argentina, which is ironic because a lot of Nazis wound up there too. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, that's why they went. Very simple reason they could not go back. So I'm assuming your your father is a veteran. Uh, I, I've only read his bio. I don't know your yeah. but but he brought the family to Canada. Is that uh, essentially they they um, okay? So his father was actually working in a pulp and paper mill in Canada near Quebec. Okay, Temiskaming was the little municipality there, and Tembec Timber uh, is is the company now. And he was making money like immigrants do. They come to Canada, they come to the U.S., they make money. Uh, it might be minimum wage here, but when they send the money home, it's it's godsend. Yeah. So my, my grandfather was actually here for, since 26. So my father in 1946, he got deported to, to the Soviet Union, his brother, two sisters, and their mother and a couple cousins and other relatives and they eventually got out um when germany invaded the united the ussr um all of a sudden poles weren't enemies so they let some of them out of the ussr they went through the middle east and my uh, uncle wound up uh, going to the uh, to england because they needed uh, Air Force personnel, so he was a ground crew over there. My aunt, two aunts and grandmother wound up as refugees in Uganda, because the British owned most of the world, quite frankly, in those days. Quite frankly, if they didn't, we wouldn't be here, because uh, it was thanks to the British that they got into the Middle East, thanks to the British that they got to India, thanks to the British they were armed in, in uh the Middle East and fought in Italy under British command, British Eighth Army, and they took care of the refugees. They didn't want to take care of the refugees, quite frankly. They only wanted soldiers, yeah. the British, and I don't blame them, <laughs> but the, the Poles did everything they could to take their families out, and they created a female uh, army specifically to put women in there and call them soldiers, you know, okay. just so they could get them out. So. Uh, that's the thing. I forgot what we were talking about. <laughs> I was just said what brought your father to Canada, but his, the, his father yeah. already. Yeah, so that's it. He brought his family to Canada. 
Uh, they actually came uh, separate ways, and they all wound up in Temiskaming, actually, at the beginning. Uh, and then came to, to Toronto a few years later, and the rest is history. <laughs> um, now, the, the museum itself, uh, back to the Orlinsky Museum, yeah. do you have areas of, of specific focus? Like it, it certainly sounds like the collections have been gathered from the veterans, originally at least from the veterans at Ave Villa. Um, but yeah. do you have focal points of the, of the, of the collections? It, it is, what we are trying to do more than anything is save any uh, Polish historical documents and memorabilia, preferably from uh, the wars, because they tend to get thrown out in the garbage by children who don't get it. Right. Wives who don't get it. You know, the amount of stuff, the amount of important stuff that's gone into the garbage just makes my heart break. So we're trying to, number one, tell people, if you don't know what to do with it, give it to us. Yeah. We'll we'll tell you if it's important. Uh, there's a lot of stuff we get donated that's junk. That goes to uh, it's get redonated. We have limited space, so we can only keep so much. Uh, but that's the thing, and the, the focus obviously is World War II because that's where these people came from. But we, uh, thanks to Stan Krzyzewski in London, who is a um, librarian by trade, a historian, and a poet. He has published a number of things and delved into a number of truly Polish-Canadian issues that we've been exploring as well. So you have World War I, but you also have the first Poles in Canada uh, who came with um, the British to fight the Americans. This is an interesting story, if I may. Please. During the Napoleonic Wars, when Britain and uh, uh, France were at war, Poland didn't exist. It had it lost its independence to the three powers, Russia, Germany, uh, slash Prussia, and the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So the Poles had been promised independence by Napoleon. So they fought for Napoleon. In fact, his uh, guard of honor was Polish cavalry. And the Poles who got captured by the British were given the choice to either fight the Americans in the War of 1812 or languish in jail. So, of course, jails in those days weren't very happy places. So they decided, okay, I'll take my chances. So they came to the New World, and there are Polish military men buried in unmarked graves all over the southern Niagara frontier that yep. fought in the War of 1812. So Stan was looking into these gentlemen, looking into uh, this. He wrote a couple of books about it. Yep. He self-publishes because that keeps costs down to the museum. And, you know, you don't have to have a run of a million copies or anything anymore. You can just do a few copies at a time. So it doesn't cost you a heck of a lot. But... Uh, so basically what we're exploring is Canadian connections with the Polish military. The other major one was uh, the training camp at Niagara on the Lake for um, about 22,000 men eventually went through there, mostly Amer Polish Americans, uh -huh. to go fight in World War I in 1917, 1918, 1919. And there was a, a camp at Owen Sound, where Poles were being trained. Oh. Nobody knows about that. No, oh, I don't know that one at all. Yeah. And um, but Poles were, were involved in other training. They were, sorry, they were fighting as American soldiers? Uh, that The camp in Owen Sound was Poles coming in for training and then going back through okay. England. England. Okay. Yeah. World War II. They found out uh, uh, about the camp because there is a beech tree off the Bruce Trail that a Pole had carved his um, uh, a little saying in, you know, we fight for Poland, uh, Polish soldier 1942. And it still exists there, although the tree is kind of on its way out. <laughs> but um, 
this became the famous Polish tree in, in Owen Sound. And uh, then they found out there was a camp there. And uh, there were others. There was a recruiting office for World War I in Windsor and, and, and uh, the secret camp X in, uh, where was it, Belleville or somewhere east? Oshawa. Oshawa, Oshawa yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, you know, the, the Poles and, and Canadians have had their lives touched quite deeply. Very much so. Yeah, so uh, Stan is looking at, at that, those connections because we are Canadian after all. Yeah. And the interest to Canadians of just purely Polish stuff is, is minimal, you know, any ethnic group, you know. But when you have can, Canadian connections, the interest levels go, go up. Absolutely. Yeah. One of the things that we've focused on a great deal of our research at Heritage of Mississauga has been the War of 1812 over time. And uh, uh, we sponsor a reenactment company called uh, The Second York. Yeah. Um, and it, it, it uh, honors the individuals from historic Mississauga who served yeah. in 1812. But we've also documented uh, the passage, if you will, of the Devotville re uh, Regiment. That's and, the one. And uh, the, although the commanding officers were Swiss, uh, the yeah. soldiers were Polish. Uh, yeah. In large. And, and uh, you know, it, it's it's a fascinating connection. And, and one of our, our leading historians in the in the in Thompson's company uh, is very passionate about those Polish connections. So, <laughs> ah, so I'll get him in touch with Stan. Yes, I, I think I've already done that. Actually. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> Good. On the ball, on the ball. Uh, but uh, but uh, the, the the connections are all around us, right? Like yes, they are. Yes, they are. Uh, and and you do you you remark on those layers of history because you, you you we have no way of knowing at least at this point, you know, the the descendants of those Devotville Re Re regiment soldiers. Like, where did they end up? Did they stay? Yeah. Did they go? There were there were a few that ended up uh, in Manitoba, right? With anglicized names. <laughs> I think that's always a challenge too of tracing them. Yep. You must find that yep. a challenge too. Is uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Are, are, for the museum itself with the, the different focus points that it has, but largely again, like you said, on the Second World War. Uh, do you find compatriot museums elsewhere, like in Poland itself, that uh, contribute? There, there is no end to the amount of tiny museums in North America like ours. Okay, I've visited one in Cleveland. Um, and, and on and on, you know, Buffalo has many, of course, and uh, Poland certainly has a, a scores of museums as well, and they're all uh, tiny by, by and large, yeah. but um, uh, Stan uh, knows Polish better than I do, and uh, George, of course, they, they've been in contact with some of these. In fact, we did a, a, a project together with the Museum of the Polish Army, in a place called Bydgoszcz in in, um, in Poland, yep. and through that connection, we were able to secure some money from the Polish Senate to do some uh, uh, um, digitizing. Right. So you know the connections uh, with these uh, museums is is invaluable, and and there's plenty of them. What, what about the, um, like, I've been to your facility and uh, oh. uh, had, a, had a tour with Rob. Uh, okay. It feels, like, it feels like ages ago, but I think yeah. it's a little less than a year ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, COVID has erased all sense of time, I think. Oh, my gosh. Yes, it has. <laughs> but uh, as, as incredible as the museum's, the museum collection itself was and the exhibits, and I'm particularly fascinated with the models and, and yeah. like. But what about the, the, the resource library itself? Like the, you have an extensive collection there of, of resource materials. Yeah, the library uh, actually began as a library for the residents. Okay. But because the uh, age of the residents is so advanced now, very few of them actually read anymore. You know, they can't see. And what's happened is we've kind of squeezed out half of that, that uh, library and taken it over with the museum library. Okay. Again, we get so many donations of books, magazines, periodicals um, from the war era, the post-war uh, era fighting the communist regime. Uh, there was a huge movement in a lot of Poles were in, in uh, France and Paris, especially producing materials. <clears throat> and, and you get some very interesting materials, including some um, wartime material. The Polish army would have published in uh, Palestine, for example. There are pal uh, 
they published uh, books for for teachers to teach the kids who had in Siberia you were drummed um, Soviet propaganda history. So now they had an opportunity to teach the kids real history and Polish language, which had been suppressed. So uh, it, not so much in the Middle East but until they got to Palestine, they started doing publishing on a larger scale. And then there are publications in Rome, immediate post-war. The um, Polish government in exile had moved from Warsaw to uh, Hungary, to France, and then to London. And they published a lot of material to counter the negative propaganda coming out of Warsaw and Moscow. Um, tremendous amount of material in, from London. So a lot of this stuff is actually quite fascinating and historical. And I wish we had more space. <laughs> Doesn't every museum feel that way? It's, it's the eternal optimism of the eternal curse. Uh, yeah. In terms of, uh, I mean, we are not in normal times, but we can, we can hope to see that coming back to us at some point in the future. Yeah. Um, in normal conditions, how do people interact with the museum itself? Are, are they able to come in and view the collection? Because you are in a, in, a, in a different environment. You are in a facility that cares for people. And so... Uh, how how do people access you and connect with you? What they do is they contact us and then we uh, see them by appointment. Okay. And that can be individual, it can be groups. We've had scouting group through there and so on. We prefer small groups of people because there's less chance of, you know, mischief and theft and whatever. <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, definitely by appointment. We'll, we'll, somebody will come down and, and meet you and give you a tour. That's for sure. Um, the only exception to that would be flu season right. when there's a flu and we don't want to bring uh, the flu into the uh, seniors residence. Right. And of course now, <laughs> yeah, well, but yeah, yeah that's it. It's uh, easy to get a tour. You just have to arrange it. Right. And you've got uh, Rob shared with us, I think, uh, Facebook and Instagram connections. And yeah, uh, he, so he's, he's the young kid. So he's taking care of all of that stuff. <laughs> very passionate fellow. Very passionate. Very much so, and his his um, non Polish uh, girlfriend yeah. uh, Justine, which in Polish they call her Justyna, uh, uh, she's she's just as passionate. And we're tickled to death about that. No, they're 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 thrilled with it, and they're very excited to share it too, which is lovely to see. And we're glad to have them. The um, in terms of the, I mean, you are in, and I don't. The, I'm, I'm asking a historian to prognosticate, so I apologize. <laughs> it's a dangerous environment, but yeah. You're, you're, you're in a facility that has its limits, and it's a non-traditional facility from a museum perspective, but I don't yeah. know if you know, traditional works anymore, but do you have a vision of, of the growth of this museum over time? Or is it not, not maybe you, but perhaps the, the directors in large, do they have an idea of what they want to see it become? Or? Well, we are actually just uh, in the process of incorporating. Okay. Um, this is one step in the growth of the museum. Okay. Uh, we had been getting donations and whatnot, but because Vaval Villa has a mission to take care of its residents, um, the board of directors has always been leery of accepting donations and handing them over to the museum, which is not part of their, their core business, so to speak. Yeah. They were always worried about what um, uh, the char charitable organization people would have to say about it. So um, by separating our business from theirs, that's step one. So we're in the process of incorporating. Once we incorporate, we can raise funds on our own without worrying about Vavo Villa, without having Vavo Villa involved or at risk. We raise funds, we can, we can deal. Uh, the Polish government is uh, always interested in what's out there in Polonia outside of Poland, because they know that a lot of stuff went with the Poles when they escaped. Uh, so they're always willing to help. But by being independent, this will open up great doors from us. Physically, 
I don't know if we're ever going to move from where we are for the simple reason is we pay $1 rent a year. Hard to beat that. <laughs> <laughs> we, you know, and we have three rooms and we have support system there. Yeah. Uh, round the clock security, you know, you name it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there are many advantages to being there. It is almost invisible to the general public. But then again, even if you get any of your small Mississauga museums, they may be there, but how many people actually know that they're there, right? You have to shout, you have to shout. So being in the basement is almost not a hindrance in that sense, being a small museum and the benefits, uh, the financial benefits truly uh, uh, are wonderful. So. We might be staying in the basement for a while. Well, it, it, and having been to the site, and uh, at, at the end of this, we'll actually sh we'll share the links on how people can get yeah. in touch with you and, and that sort of. But having been to the site, I mean, it's a marvelous space. It really is, and yeah. uh, the collection is superb. Uh, the exhibits, like I said, I I, I love the models. I'm, I'm a model nut, so. I, well, I'm, that's yeah, I, technically not a museum piece, but I, I realize. <laughs> <laughs> But the little kid in me loves it. Uh, I know it. I know. Well, that's why they're there. Yeah. <laughs> but um, the uh, the uniforms are, you know, an incredible display of the the military, and they're they're so uh, beautifully preserved. Um, and and I, we can go on and on of the things that you've got the pro wooden propeller uh, from uh, yeah the from Kaminsky, right? The training or, training plane, yeah. No, uh, that's not Kaminsky. That's that's a, just a, a general training plane right. that they used. Yeah. Okay. But it just the the imagery you have the uh, the medals on display and uh, it just it, it's it's an exceptional place. We're going to show some pictures here of uh, uh -huh. of, of, of of the different things in the museum and the stuff that Rob had shared with us as well. Okay, good. Um, but it, it's just exceptional, and I really hope you know when we get back to whatever normal looks like, yeah. um, you know that we can help share uh, the story of the museum uh, to the residents of the city and and. Uh, share yet another hidden gem in our city to uh, to come and explore uh, when yeah. time allows. Um, and you know, a lot of the, the displays we've been doing, again, have Canadians in mind. Yeah. Like the, the display that Rob is doing, you don't show the, you have to, you can't show boring stuff, right? right. Uh, we always, wherever we went, we would take a helmet because everybody wants to put on the helmet, you know? A little bit of entertainment value, keep the interest level up. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So that's we're always looking uh, and thinking that way. I always said the, the key is uh, is uh, 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 providing education without realizing that they're get, you're getting they're getting one. <laughs> that's exactly right. Uh, yeah, so I like that. I like that. Get the audience with entertainment. Well, then you're still getting the audience. So yeah, uh, that's that's for uh, sure. But a, a exceptional job, and I, I think uh, I think for for us, we'll, we can we'll wrap up on that, and then maybe we can. Uh, Revisit this and uh, down the road and have another conversation. I'd really you like bet. To the work of the of it's, the museum. So it's been a pleasure. Uh, so Henrik, thank you so much, and uh, we wish the Orlinsky Museum nothing but the best moving forward. And uh, of course, getting through these days of COVID, and you have a particular challenge being in a long term. <laughs> yeah. Um, you talk about a double whammy of trying to uh, trying to reopen, but uh, you know, here's hoping our fingers crossed that the spring looks a little bit different in 2021 and. Uh, um, you know, the doors can open again and people can come and, and visit and, and interact. And uh, Yeah, you yeah. bet. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Amy, for your question uh, here on Ask a Historian. Uh, one that is particularly touching on the heels of Remembrance Day and to, to look back from the, uh, on those who served and fell from this community. Your question is about the last soldier, the most recent casualty in war, uh, for, who resided and came from uh, the city of Mississauga. Uh, and the last of our fallen uh, to date, and, and hopefully, you know, we can, we can always pray that there are not more that follow. But the last of our fallen uh, passed away on March 8th of 2009 in Afghanistan, and he, he was Trooper Mark Diab of the Royal Canadian Dragoons, and he was only 22 years of age. Uh, Mark spent his teenage years uh, here in Mississauga, and uh, uh, but he was uh, born and grew up in uh, southern Lebanon, uh, and he and he grew up in his early years in the midst of war in that country. Um, inspired by what he saw 
in in the war and there, there are a number of, uh, of biographies and memorials posted to him and I do encourage you to uh, to, to read more about uh, the life and times of, uh, of Mark Diab um, but he grew inspired to become a soldier uh, from a very young age that is what he wanted to do but he wanted to serve in the efforts of making the world a safer place uh, in simple terms he wanted to help he wanted to be part of a, of a solution um, and uh, uh, he, he sought out that career path in his life uh, in hopes of making a difference. Uh, again, he spent his teenage years here in Mississauga and uh, uh, beside his career aspirations of being a soldier, uh, he was passionate about photography, music and poetry um, and Jeeps apparently. Uh, he had a beloved Jeep uh, and uh, a great deal of his passion was talking about, uh, about Jeeps. Um, he made special efforts to connect with the uh, with older members in, in, in his community and had a great deal of respect for every person that he dealt with um, and he's known particularly uh, for his large and generous smile and his big heart um, kind of really supporting the uh, those within his community um, he loved mentoring uh, uh, younger uh, younger people younger kids and students in summer camps uh, and uh, he was a soccer coach a youth soccer coach as well and uh, um, his family described him as being a bit of an old soul. He was uh, very aware of the dangers that uh, the service brought, um, but was also preparing himself uh, for that life as well. Uh, and again, it just he, he he comes across having never met him by some myself, but read about him and. Uh, uh, participated in uh, several remembrance services at the time. Um, uh, it came across as really a genuine good soul, um, and our city is is poorer for his loss. Um, again, uh, Trooper Mark Diab of the Royal Canadian Dragoons was killed in service uh, in Afghanistan on March 8th of 2009 at the age of 22. Uh, in Mississauga, Whitehorn Park was officially renamed uh, a Trooper Mark Diab Park in 2010. Um, and uh, the park is located near uh, St. Joseph Secondary School, uh, which is where Mar Mar Diab attended classes uh, when his family first arrived from, uh, from uh, Lebanon to Canada in 2000. So uh, in honor of, of Mark Diab, we offer a simple thank you for your service and we will remember you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us once again on Ask a Historian and uh, it is a pleasure each week to explore the stories of the city of Mississauga with you and we look forward to doing so. So please send in your questions and uh, we will have some fun exploring the footsteps of yesteryear with you. And a reminder that next week is Heritage Mississauga's 60th anniversary and we look forward to exploring the stories of our organization with you. Uh, also on a note, uh, we, we spoke this week about uh, the uh, life and, uh, and passing of Trooper Mark Diab in 2009. I direct you to a memorial video that has been produced uh, with proceeds going to uh, several foundations and charities and it is called If I Should Fall um, and highly recommend it for uh, people interested in learning more about the life and times of a soldier from this community. And uh, again, www.ifishouldfall.com.